You know, d- d- does that really happen in churches? Do things really happen like that? Churches are supposed to be a place where people are friendly, where they're caring, where they're kind, where they're loving. But Tom Rayner, who is a researcher, author, president of Lifeway Publishing in Nashville, has found in his research that um, life may in fact be completely different in churches. He writes this, he said, I've, I've heard the statement, we are the friendliest church in town. He said, I've heard that statement thousands of times in over 500 church consultations and over thousands of members in church member interviews, I've heard them say that. Most church members really think their church is very friendly. He says, more times than not, though, they're wrong. Guests who visit churches usually have a much different perspective. And then he lists six things that he says he's found in all of his years of research. Six things to consider if you think your church is really friendly. Um, He says, first, almost all church leaders consider their church friendly. But he has in his research strong evidence that would show contrary. He says, second, volumes of survey data from church guests indicate that very few churches are really friendly. Surveys over a 10-year period indicate that 8 in 10 guests do not consider the church that they visited to be very friendly. Third thing he says, church members perceive their churches to be friendly because they've established relationships in the church. But he goes on to point out the guests don't have those relationships. So you and I are going, well, of course we're a friendly place. I talk to all my friends. I go out and I eat with them. We have a lot of fun. And and people who walk through the door the first time are going, nobody said boo to me. Or or they asked for directions and then walked off. He says, um, uh, number four, Many church members see their church as friendly because they have a brief stand and greet time. And he said there's much more to genuine friendliness than two-minute greeting time. Number five, we found that most guests who think a church is unfriendly never let anybody know. They just left and didn't come back. And then number six, he says, we found no significant evidence that church members are connecting with unchurched persons and bringing them to worship, which he said should be a true indicator of genuine friendliness when you and I connect with our friends in a very real and a very friendly, um, relational way in the world, and we invite them to church, it should make a difference in their life. Um, He kind of adds to that in another survey. He talks about uh, things that drive away first-time visitors, and he mentions that stand and greet time again because everybody feels awkward and and he mentions uh unfriendly church members you know if you're just going to stand there and and someone comes in and walks right by you don't say hi to them um they will leave and go i'm not going back because that place is unfriendly and then another thing he said in that list of top 10 why um guests don't come back number nine is members telling guests can you imagine what they told them you're in my seat which really blows my mind. I had to double check, and I have confirmed nobody's name is on any of the seats in this building. And so for someone to be sitting in your seat seems to me to be an impossibility. Um, I know that people mean that, you know, like, that's my seat. I sit there every week. And I guess my comment would be, (laughs) no, you don't, if someone else is already there. Well, but that's my seat. I, I, you know, I put my stuff there, and, and they, they moved my stuff and sat down. I was saving that seat. I mean, that is so rude, and I think, it's kind of rude to just leave your stuff in people's way. Move it. And so we have this mentality that we may not say you're sitting in my seat, but we have all these little markers along the way. And, and um, guests come in, and they don't know where to sit. They don't know what to do. And they come in, and they sit down in a vacant seat. They find, and oh, someone forgot their books. They slide it to the side, and they're sitting there. And then you or I come up, and we just kind of stare at them for a little while, and we expect them to move. If that happens, we miss an opportunity next week to bring them one step closer to Jesus. Not only do we miss the opportunity for God through us to impact their life, but to impact the lives of everyone they know and they're going to talk to this week. Do you know what they did to me at that church? I would never go there. 
I think instead, I, I, I would challenge us that we take an uncomfortable situation and we strive to make it comfortable. It's, it's, it's a game I like to play. When you walk into an uncomfortable situation, how do you take that and make it comfortable? How do you ease the tension? How, how do you refocus the, the um, edge in the air? And if you come in or I come in and our stuff has moved over and someone's sitting in our seat, let's start that game. It's a really easy game to play. I'll tell you a true story. I got the chance to play this game in the middle of town with my youngest son present. Um, the church had helped an individual in the community um, with some projects he had that needed done around his house, some home maintenance things. He, he didn't have any family. He didn't really have any friends. He was a different individual. He was um, I'm kind of an odd duck. We'll call him Billy. And um, the church had helped. I hadn't seen Billy in quite a while. Um, we... Uh, it had been probably three years. My youngest son and I were going to Pizza Hut for lunch several years back. We're supposed to meet somebody there. And as we walk through the front doors, you know how you just kind of you walk in and you, you start looking. You're not really paying attention to who's around you. You're looking for who you're supposed to meet. And we did that. And I'm looking and I'm standing right there by the hot bar. A guy turns around and he goes, well, Tom Hess. When was this guy? Billy. And I'm like, oh, well, Billy, how you doing? He goes, it's so good to see you. And he's got a plate full of food. And he reaches out to shake my hand. And I kid you not, the second our hands meet, his shorts hit the floor. And, and talk about an uncomfortable situation. I'm now standing in the middle of Pizza Hut holding a guy's hand and his shorts are on the floor. <laughs> he's standing there in his T-shirt and his tidy whities And we are trying to make an uncomfortable situation comfortable. And so I said, well, uh, Billy, how are you doing? <laughs> well, well, well. And he's, he, he let's go of my hand real quick, but mind you, he's got a huge plate full of food, and he's trying to hold it, and he's trying to reach down, and he's trying to one-hand him up. But you ever try to pull your, your pants on in the morning with one hand? It doesn't work. And I'm trying to make an uncomfortable situation comfortable. So I'm like, let me hold your plate for you. And, oh, thank you. He gets his pants yarded back up and grabs his plate. And he goes, well, that was, that was embarrassing. And I'm like, ah, oh, don't worry about it, you know. <laughs> I'm sure that happens to people all the time. <laughs> Imagine if you were the guy holding the hand of the man whose pants were on the floor. Try to make an uncomfortable situation comfortable. And I think when you and I come in and we see someone sitting in our seat and they moved our stuff over, and, and mind you, I am going somewhere with this that deals with Scripture, it's an opportunity for us to say, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't mean to leave my stuff in the way, and I will move that. It gives you and me a chance to say, I'm not sure if we've had the chance to meet yet. What's your name? And if they say, well... <laughs> My name's Joe. I've been here, I've been coming here for five months now. I met you the last three weeks. You know what? That's, that's, that's life, and it's a chance to go, I am so sorry. I forgot. And ask them a couple questions about themselves. It's a chance to get to know them as you get your stuff, and you go find your seat, a new seat, a place where you can sit, and you take the uncomfortable, and you make it comfortable. Why? Because those people matter. Whether it's your friends, my friends, or someone you and I have never met before, they matter. They matter to God, and they matter to us as well. Excuse me one minute. And wind in the microphone from that. So we take and we make an uncomfortable situation comfortable. Churches that think they're friendly aren't. And you and I have to figure out a way to be friendlier. Why? Because we want to be the nicest church in town? No. But because if your friends and my friends don't come back, we don't get an opportunity together to grow and take them one step closer to Jesus. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 16. Paul writes this, Amidst 
a lot of the instructions to Romans, he says, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud or enjoy the company. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Don't think that you know it all. Live in harmony with each other. You know, last week we talked about unity and how unity is different than union. Union is sharing the same space at the same time, but unity is having a common purpose and a common direction. And we talked about how in, in this juncture of our journey as a body of believers, uh, there is no time greater than the present for Satan to really creep into the church and try and create disunity and disharmony and upset the focus of why we're doing what we're doing. And that is to meet people and to love them one step closer to Jesus. Satan is determined to divide and conquer. Whether that's here at church, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your workplace, or in your neighborhood. Scripture says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So last week we looked at our unifying purpose, bringing people one step closer to Jesus. And a journey's made up of a thousand steps. It doesn't matter if we're step 10, 11, 12, or step 791, 92, or 93. We want to play a part as long as God will allow us to play a part in bringing people closer to Jesus. That is our unity. And God desires unity. But we just read here, he also desires harmony. Harmony is similar to unity. Could even be a synonym, but it means to have the same mind in, in the Greek word there. To have the same mind, to cherish the same views, to side with that person. We're not just passively getting along, but we're actually in step together. We're working in the same direction. We have not only the same goals and purpose, but we have movement together towards those goals and purpose. He says live in harmony. Well, what does that look like? That's where we read in that next verse. Don't be too proud. What does harmony look like? Don't be too proud. Enjoy the company of ordinary people. Pride. Pride is a killer. It's a killer for harmony. It's a killer for unity. It, it's a killer in churches. It's a killer in families. It's a killer in workplaces. You and I have both seen um, very accomplished Sports athletes, professional athletes that continue to tank their career because they are so prideful and so arrogant. They can't play on the same team with other people. They don't know how to play nice with others. It's all about them. But scripture says don't be proud, which deals with haughtiness or conceited, conceitness, conceited attitude, self-exalted attitude. I, I'm, I'm continually amazed at times, don't hear it much anymore, but there have been times in churches, and we've heard it here in the past, you know, well, I've been a member of Berea for X number of years. And I'm like, well, great, what does that mean? And what it should really say is, if you've been a member of Berea for five years, or for 10 years, or for 20, or 30, or 50, or 150 years, awesome then you understand this is not about you, and it's not about me. This is about us together taking people one step closer to Jesus as you and I continue to grow in our relationship with him. It's that idea of pride, of haughtiness, of arrogance that would say, I should get preference, I should get special treatment, I should get consideration. There should be partiality on my behalf in this area or this arena or in this situation because I am different. The scripture says it's not true. We don't deserve special favor, special preference, or partiality. When we do that and when we take that attitude, when we take that approach into our families, into our marriages, into our workplace, and even into our church, into our relationship with other believers, we find out very quickly, quickly that's what separates us, that's what divides us, that's what destroys unity. Because now we're not on the same page. I've set myself apart. I've put myself in another arena. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 puts it this way. Don't be selfish. He's saying it's not about me. Don't try to impress others. Again, look at me. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself, meaning that it's my responsibility to give them preferential consideration and treatment. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. 
You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And then he goes on from there to describe that attitude that Jesus had. God in flesh became the ultimate example of servanthood. When he stepped down from his throne, when he entered this world, when he put on flesh, and when he saw a need in our lives that we could never meet. And he made a way where there was no way as he died on the cross for your sin and my sin. Scripture says that's the example of servanthood. That's the example of, of the opposite, the antithesis of pride and haughtiness and arrogance where someone would say, I am here to look out for someone else's interest or to serve them. If anybody ever had a right to claim special favor, it was Jesus. Over the past six months, as things have become crazy crowded here at Berea, <coughs> Leadership has had the opportunity to be encouraged time and time again as people have given up their seats, their seats. Some have said, I've heard second and third hand, well, there was a lady sitting beside us this last week, and, and we had invited some of our family, and they came for the first time, and her and her husband said, oh, honey, they can have these seats. We'll just move. There, there are people that have said, you know, I had... Um, Nowhere for my wife to sit when she got here and someone else moved. And a couple of those people, actually, when they moved, they moved to make room for, for first-time guests. They went back into, if you remember, we had like 50, 60 seats in Fellowship Hall, worst seating in the building, and they went back to the back of Fellowship Hall to give preference and special treatment to someone they didn't even know. Like, Man, how awesome is that? I talked with a guy who was a first-time visitor, and um, actually he had come several times. Uh, it was his a third or fourth time. And somebody here in the church met them, and they said, well, hey, introduced themselves. And they said, uh, um, I haven't met you. Is this your first time here? And, and our guest said, no, this is actually our third time or our fourth time. I forget. Well, that's about the time you felt awkward. And their response was so great. Take an uncomfortable situation, make it comfortable. They said, I can't believe that. You've been here that many times and I haven't met you yet. I am so sorry. I'm like, man, that's great. People caring about other people so that your friends and my friends can come and learn more about God. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interest, but take an interest in another with the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. And here's why it's so important. I believe it starts in the seats before we are able to transfer it to the streets. If, if you and I cannot learn how to live in harmony and to live in unity when we are on the same page in, in our direction, purpose, goal, and agenda in life, how on earth do we take that living outside of these doors and outside of these walls? How, how do we show the world a church that is unified and loving and caring? When God changes the hearts and minds and lives of those of us on the inside, those of us on a spiritual journey here, then I think he's able to use us to work more effectively in the world around us. In other words, when he grows us, I believe we become less of a hindrance to what he's trying to do in the lives of others. Look at, the, look at Romans chapter 12, that verse 16 again. That last part, don't be proud. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. You know, the New American Standard puts it this way. It says, be willing to associate with people of low position. And if you read that, it, it may give you an incorrect understanding or view of what he's saying there. He's not talking about people that are beneath us or people that we're, we're better than them or people that, and that's oftentimes a Christian's take when we read scripture. Well, Jesus wants me to hang out with those people. I need to love those people. I, I think the New Living Translation translates it uh, so well when it says, enjoy the company of ordinary people. They're just ordinary Joe, ordinary Jane. They aren't people of a high social status or standard. 
There aren't the people like James talks about in James chapter 2 when he says someone comes into your meeting and they're well-dressed and they have money and you say, oh my goodness, come right over here and sit down right here in this place of honor because you're someone special. And then he says someone comes in who has nothing and they're dressed pretty shabby. And you could probably build on that and say they don't smell the greatest. They didn't comb their hair this morning. They are missing several teeth. They are this, that, or the other. Go through a whole list of, of the way society judges people. And James says, you're going to tell that person, well, come over here. we got a spot for you. It's like kind of back here. It's in the corner. And yet churches do it every day. We treat people with preference because of who they are or what they have or how we know them or how long they've been around. Paul says in Romans, enjoy the company of ordinary people with no high social position or standing. Allow yourself, he says, when you associate, you're allowing yourself to be carried away or to be led away to be identified with that person. When you and I see that person that has no great social standing, they, they have no city office, they are no uh, public figure of authority, whether it's an officer or a fire department, or they, they, they've done, they're just a normal person, and you and I identify with them. Or when there are people that have made bad decisions in life, and they have a bad past, and they have a rough history that they're trying to climb out of by the grace of God and with his help, that you and I would come alongside of them and say, yesterday doesn't matter. What we are concerned about is where tomorrow will take you in your relationship with God. And I believe as the church begins to to level the playing field and to see people with the eyes of Jesus and live a spiritual life that's balanced, that we would not treat somebody, whether they have lots of money or little money, whether they make great decisions their entire life or whether they made one decision after another that just stinks, that we would treat them the same. And the bottom line is we would care about them for who they are and not what they can do for us. Jesus says in Luke, he goes, when you have a feast, he says, don't invite all of your friends and all of these people with money because they'll repay you back. Have you ever done that? You ever, or maybe you've been a part of that. Someone invites you to a, a special event and, or maybe it's a dinner at their house and you feel like, well, you know, they had us over to their house. Now we need to have them over to our house. Or, or maybe as Christmas gets closer, you feel the crunch in, uh, in your work environment where, oh, well, we're doing like an office Christmas party and everybody's getting presents and this person got me a present, so I have to get them a present. And some of you, if you were honest, would even say, I don't even like that person. And I got to get them a present. Well, here's an idea. Take their present, rewrap it, and give it back. <laughs> Just saying. Here, here, here's, here's the thing. We have that attitude that Jesus is talking about in Luke when he says we have this quid pro quo where we, we, we have this relationship where we think we need to do for them because they did for us. Or if I do for you, then you need to do for me. And when we enter into that relationship with people, we are unable to treat people equally. But when we see them with the eyes of Christ... We will see them as we hopefully see ourselves, that I am a messed up sinner, and I need his grace just as much as everybody else. And so does that person, and so does that person, and so does that person, and so does that person. Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 was walking along one day. He saw a man named Matthew sitting in tax collector's booth. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And he said, follow me and be my disciple. So Matthew got up and he followed him and later Jesus or Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as a dinner guest along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Now you got a picture of this. Jesus chooses one of the outcast, one of the hated, one of the marginalized, one of the the, the people in society that nobody else liked. And Jesus, if you were a real Jew, you wouldn't even talk with him. Jesus, if you really, really loved God, you would not be seen with him. Jesus, if you were serious about what you proclaim to believe, 
you'd marginalize people like that too. Jesus invites Matthew. Matthew says, Jesus, I want you to meet some of my friends. I want you to meet some people that are just as messed up as I am, Matthew's saying. And Jesus says, that's what I'm here for. And as he goes and he has dinner with them in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 9, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the church people that got it all together, they saw this and they asked Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? And when Jesus said this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. And then if you, if you slide down into verse 14, he says this, or the end of verse 13, he says, I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, not those who think they have it all together, not those who think they don't need me, but he said, I've come for those who know they're sinners. I wonder if you and I can develop a vision for other people that has a balanced perspective like Jesus had. A perspective that doesn't give preference because we've known someone longer. A perspective that doesn't give partiality because someone can give back after we give to them. But, but a perspective of people that says regardless of who you are, where you've come from, we're on the same page that we want Jesus to change our lives one step at a time. And with that perspective, might we live in harmony and unity. Can you and I see people as Jesus sees them? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Father, we thank you for the many ways that you open our eyes to our failures, our shortcomings, <laughs> the ways in life that we are so much less than you would desire us to be. God, forgive us for the times that we we treat people with preference because of uh, who they are or what they have or what they can do for us. And, and for the times that we, we sideline and we marginalize others who don't have, others who've made terrible mistakes. God, help us to come alongside them and love them like you do, to see them with your eyes, to see a brother or a sister in Christ that regardless of the past, they're headed the same direction we are, trying to grow one step closer. And God, as you give us a, a balanced perspective in life, as we see people in the way that you see them, God, help our heart to break. God, help our heart to break for them, whether they're 12 or 95. That we would see people that apart from you will spend eternity apart from you. God, I pray that you continue to grow us closer to you. That we as your people in your church might be less of a hindrance. And we might be a more effective tool. That you through us will love the broken, the hurting, the lost, the suffering. Those who feel like they're at the end of the rope and those whose life is at a breaking point. That God, those changes might come not because of who we are, but because of how incredibly great you are. So Lord, we ask you now to unite us in purpose, in vision, in direction, that the world might know you because of the you that they see in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name.